Speaker. I'm delighted to see a full House. This is an important conversation here tonight we're, we're having with some of our greatest writers and thinkers in Ireland, Ivan Boland, Cullum Tobin and Sive, are going to just unpack a whole story about memory and Irishness and connection and the importance of memory and why we're remembering and celebrating 19th here tonight. Let the panel begin. You have a great joy in store, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. So we're here tonight mostly because about a hundred years ago, um, a couple of thousand Irish men and a couple of hundred Irish women launched a, an uprising in Ireland against British rule. And um, the Easter Rising, as it came to be known, was crushed within a week. But it still managed to change the course of Irish history. And um, anyone who's been following the centenary commemorations this year may have noticed that um, Irish people are still very much grappling with that history, with our past and with our present and uh, with our future. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome two um, great Irish minds here tonight, Colm Tobin, one of Ireland's premier novelists. <laughs> and Ivan Boland, one of Ireland's premier poets. Um, and both these writers have done lots of grappling with um, our Ireland then and now in their works of fact and fiction, so um, let's do some more this evening. Um, Ivan, I'll, I'll start with you, if that's okay. Um, so just going back to the time before the Easter Rising, um, Ireland in 1912-14, there was at that time um, a potential for um, a potential path to some limited form of independence in Ireland, that, that a peaceful path to that. We, the land question had been more or less resolved and um, the, there was a home rule bill uh, on the table, um, but yet things took a violent turn. Why, why do you think that happened? It, 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 there are a lot of answers, you know, to that question. I think it's an important question, but I probably have a slightly different path into it. I, I think the the rising, the people. I mean, there is a real complication, even about these hundred years. The the people who who died in the rising and the people who fought the rising were certainly heroic, and ma and many of them were literary, but we know them because we know their names. Their actions at the time gave us their names. The problem for me has always been the names we didn't see that don't get written, that don't get inscribed. And I think it was partly thinking about the rising, partly thinking about the country we have, that when I was younger and a young writer, it was clear to me eventually that there was a huge gap in Ireland between the past and history. Uh, history was the names we knew and the actions we recorded, and rightly. But the past was where many, many people lived, and many of them were women, and their names were not known, and it was a place of shadows and of whispers, and, you know, my own sense is that, you know, when we look back on these hundred years, one of the things we can do is honor that history, and we should, but also now in this Ireland, bring that, that past and that history together. And uh, Cullum, uh, with all the publications that have been come out, um, thanks to the, the commemorations, there's been a wealth of literature. You've written some stuff yourself. Do you think the past and history are getting closer together? Are we getting a better understanding of our yeah. country? Um, I think the commemorations um, this year complicated the narrative. That, um, as Ivan has said, people were uh, really aware that, yes, we had the signatories of the proclamation. Yes, we knew all about them, and there were books, and, and there were new books came out about all of them. But, th but one of the best selling books um, that remained on the Irish bestseller list throughout the period was by Joe Duffy. It was about the children who were killed in the rebellion. And people became acutely conscious of the civilian casualties of the rebellion. People became acutely conscious not only that, but of the 
context, which was that so many people, including so many Irish people, were fighting in the First World War at the very same time. This was a time of great militarization overall. So I think those contexts became very important this year. But, but what was really notable in Dublin on Easter Sunday this year was that the way in which um, the, that the government had to decide in some, who do we use to commemorate this rebellion? And the, what they did was, there, w there was, there was um, the army with every piece of material the army owns went through the city. And I stood there and watched, and you, you may not think that the Irish army is any big deal compared to other <laughs> armies, but the Irish army has never gone to war. The Irish army has been involved in peacekeeping missions under the umbrella of the United Nations. So it's one of the ways in which Irish people as citizens of a state are very proud of Ireland in the sense that so many of our troops have been in the Lebanon, have been in Bosnia, have been in the Congo, have been in Chad, have put themselves in great danger. So that sense of a state represent, being, being represented by something that, that, that was both military and oddly peaceful, that was both national and international, actually mattered to people. The Dublin's a very <coughs> cynical city. People are always sneering at something or other, quite <laughs> rightly usually. But I watched as the army went by and the applause was spontaneous and easy and long because these people had put themselves in danger for this. Now that was part of the business of the state, the Irish state, in a way taking back its own roots to say our root, the roots of the Irish state are complicated. They, they, some of them occurred in the Westminster Parliament. Daniel O'Connell, Charles Stuart Parnell were great, parliament, were great parliamentarians and you know, went to London to represent Ireland in various ways. And of course, the shadow of the famine is always there, no matter where we go or what we do, that, uh, that initial erasure in the 1840s and mm. the bleeding of people <laughs> and the way then in which um, people, people got to remember it and then not remember it. And added to that then, you put the um, actual rising itself and the way in which the executions the way in which the burial of the bodies in quicklime with no coffins, immediately after the rebellion, people who, who, who up to then had been known as poets or agitators or as people involved with nationalism, that's actually made a difference to the way people in Ireland viewed the rebels uh, compared to the way people in England viewed them. The distance between the two countries became very great in May 1916. And you can see that in the parliamentary debates in Westminster as the British are mystified by why people in Ireland are so saddened and angered by the executions. So, so the, the many, many strands that went into the making of the Irish state became part of the commemoration process. And, and we were, I think, greatly aided by uh, you know, the way in which um, the Irish education system has worked so well in one way. It's produced a new generation of really serious, hardworking, productive historians. I think novelists could learn something from them. A book a year they seem to produce each of them, plus a <laughs> column every week. And, uh, but, that, but that this time round, um, in that week, what we saw in Ireland was a way of making the narrative more complicated, which is very, very important, not only for our way of dealing with history and with the past, but also in just stepping out into the next 100 years, just that we have to know that any narrative like this is much more complicated than anyone thought. Thank you. Um, so we'll talk a bit more about the actual rising in a moment, but just as Colin brought up the commemorations there, um, so uh, there every commemoration fulfills a, a contemporary a agenda. And, what, and this time I think the agenda was inclusion um, to some extent. Do you think uh, the government achieved that, or do you think people were still left I, out? I, I think many people in, in and out of government did. And, and, you know, I know we're going to read a couple of things. And, you know, who we include, how we think about them, uh, who, who are the voices and presences that live with them. And Colm is speaking about the past and that long tributary. So this is one thing I'm going to read that, to me, brings you know, forward, who, who are we going to honor? Are we going to consider that our history is a history of heroism and, and that can be one braided strand of it? But if we do that, are we going to forget people who were really defenseless in the very face of that history? Th this is a poem that was part of the conversation 
that really I would have had with myself about that e years ago. And this is about a couple who would have come into that past, but they leave it very quickly, and they have no names really. They, they are mentioned in a book called Mishkel Fein um, by, by a Father O'Leary who wrote that book at the very, very beginning of the 20th century, a, a book that was very commonly read, but not, not so much now. He had been a very small boy in the village of Carrig Styra, West Cork, which was very badly hit by the famine. And just in about six or seven sentences, he described something his mother told him, that there was a young couple, and they left the workhouses, which were just laboratories of fever, left them one terrible winter night in 1847, and they walked back together, this young couple, to the cabin where they might have had some life. And it was a bitter night. And in the morning, they were found dead. But he, he had taken her feet and held them against his breast his, to try to warm them uh, as she died. We have no histories, no names, nothing but this emblematic people who, who lived through the terrible savagery of history. So this poem is not only written as a dark love poem, it's written to reproach the genres and conventions we live by, like the love poem, that often don't include and is part of inclusion. It's a poem that's called Quarantine. In the worst hour, of the worst season of the worst year, of a whole people, a man set out from the workhouse with his wife. He was walking, they were both walking north. She was sick with famine fever and could not keep up. He lifted her and put her on his back. He walked like that west and west and north until at nightfall, under freezing stars, they arrived. In the morning, they were both found dead of cold, of hunger, of the toxins of a whole history. But her feet were held against his breastbone. The last heat of his flesh was his last gift to her. Let no love poem ever come to this threshold. There is no place here for the inexact praise of the easy graces and sensuality of the body. There is only time for this merciless inventory. Their death together in the winter of 1847, also what they suffered, how they lived, and what there is between a man and woman, and in which darkness it can best be proved. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that poem, I believe, was one of, voted one of Ireland's top ten favorite poems, and it's my favorite, actually. It's beautiful. Um, but the, the, the famine, I'm glad you brought up the famine, because um, so 70 years, approximately 70 years before the rising, Ireland had a major catastrophe where um, one million people died of starvation. and. Uh, disease and two million emigrated, um, mostly or many of them to North America. Um, so, a column, um, and, and that event, I, th I think it's fair to say that, that the famine was not helped by the British response um, at the time. <laughs> I'm being generous. <laughs> um, but uh, how, do you, how do you, do you see a, a line at all between that event, or did the famine and, and the response to it make British rule untenable in Ireland? Um, yes, it did, uh, to, to, to one extent. I, in other words, you can begin to trace from 1848, which was a glorious year in a way for nations within Europe, yeah. and Ireland caught the end of that almost, um, the, the idea of the nation rising of small nations within Europe. So a figure like John Mitchell um, beginning to write about the fact that um, this could not have happened in England. This was done to us. And there was an us in question, the Irish nation. And you can trace that idea of the nation and what the nation must do in order to establish itself right through from what the Young Ireland movement from 1848 
um, into the Fenian movement, and directly from the Fenian movement, you can trace it to Tom Clark, who was, who was really the diehard among the signatories of the 1916 proclamation. He was not a poet, there was no poetry in him. He was interested in dynamite. <laughs> and um, he, 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 you know, in other words, he was the one who served long years of prison in English, you know, in English jails. But, but, but he had almost no social policy. The idea for him was a simple one, simply to get the British out of Ireland. And the emotion, and, and that was essentially was an emotional idea, but we are Irish, they're English, and they must go. Um, I mean, it wasn't to say we're going to be richer when they go. No, we're in some way going to be spiritually cleansed by the, by the time they go, or if they go, or when they go. And that, 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 those ideas began um, with the famine, and then, of course, began in, in New York, began with Irish America, began with people who simply came with those memories, got jobs, ran newspapers, began to make connections back home, so that all the time, when Tom Clark is let out of an English jail, and, and where does he go? He goes to New York. What happens in New York becomes even more diehard, more revolutionary, with the help of John Devoy in New York. So that that idea of creating an angry diaspora um, was one of the things, was one of the results of the famine. Besides the, uh, the other things that happened, um, which let's call them erasures. In other words, that if you went into the workhouse d during the famine, um, you had to agree that your holding would be knocked down, your mud cabin knocked down on that very day, and your lease was over. And so your farms, small holdings were cleared, big farms were made. Suddenly the landscape itself became a set of erasures. Even the graves themselves were unmarked. So, this, so that you have on one hand this silence, this fierce silence, and on the other hand you have this beginning of revolutionary noise, almost happening in tandem, or, or, almost one there to almost wipe the other out. And so I think if you're a poet considering this, or a novelist, I think you really have to look at the fact of how little there was, uh, for example, we don't have memoirs, you know, we don't, it was, it was before photography. So, so, there's, so there's so much not there from that period. And then if you're an historian, you can begin to work on, the, out, out of that catastrophe came a revolutionary movement, which, which essentially, or eventually, in using with, uh, with various attachments, became the 1916 rebellion. Thank you, and I should mention Cullum wrote a fantastic essay in the London Review of Books where he talks about um, Tom Clark and um, how his coming back to Ireland set up, set up a chain of events which led to the rising. And but one of the things he did was that he, he knew his weaknesses and he realized, as you said, there was no poetry in him. But he got the poets on his side and um, there were, among the signatories, three of them were poets. And um, art, I think, it's played a huge role in the rising. Why, why do you think at that time, Ivan, was art so important? I think, I think part of the reason, and it goes, I think it goes to a little bit some of what you were saying, and also some of what happened in Ireland after 1916 to the very present day. I mean, Ireland is not the same as many other nations. It, it, it was a nation before it was a state. The United States emerged both as a nation and a state together. Something that's a nation before it's a state means that there's always going to be, in the end, one group of people who govern a country and one group of people who imagine a country. And I know some of the signatories, like Pierce, would have thought that they imagined an Ireland. And in, in his poem, The Fool, you know, that's what, what Pierce says, you know. You know, I, I've imagined this country, and you know, people that I've loved, will we not answer together? But I, I think that it's been a complicated, difficult, and times painful story. There was censorship of Irish writing, in my view, the, there are heroes uh, in, in the formation of the state, of course, the, the, the signatories especially, but you know, uh, many of our heroes are Irish writers who simply did not accept any narrowing or uh, clouding of that hope to have an inclusive society, and I think a, an enormous amount is owed to them.
Yeah, absolutely. And you actually mentioned in that London Review of Books uh, article that um, s some of the major writers of, of the time, um, Yeats, Joyce, and O'Casey, the playwright, were all circling this story, and they were not just writing about it, they also knew the people personally. There was, O'Casey was in the Citizen Army, I believe, for a while but they really interrogated it afterwards. And um, can you talk a little bit about I, that? Yeah, I think the relationship between James Joyce and the rebellion really needs more examination. Um, he, you know, he's in Trieste. Um, he had, in University College Dublin, he had gone to Irish classes where Patrick Pierce was his teacher. He had disliked Pierce immediately, good old Joyce, and he had decided he would learn Norwegian in retaliation. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> and he, you know, he wanted to read Ibsen in the original. Um, but, but himself and Piers would have seen each other regularly in the years before Joyce left Dublin. But, but as, he, as the rebellion is going on, Joyce is beginning to write Ulysses. In other words, he's written two or three chapters. He has a plan for the book. Now, the idea, and, and, and he's aware of it, as are many others, this country, this, this country, this nation is about to become a state. And his interest is, what sort of state will this be? And by placing a Jewish hero into the city, yeah. a sort of every man, a man with a glittering sort of intelligence, a man who has no particular hatreds um, that, that, that are atavistic, let's say, Leopold Bloom, by placing him at the very center of the book and at the very end of the book by letting a woman speak uninterrupted, <laughs> that he was actually engaged actively in the politics of Ireland in the writing of his novel, Ulysses. And that's just one example of a, of, of a way in which a writer you know, attempted to intervene in what was a, a, a sort of vacuum, in what sort of country will it be? I mean, Yeats was involved in this in another sort of way. And then, of course, Sean O'Casey, in the way in which 10 years after the rebellion, um, in The Plough and the Stars, he wrote a play which really did effectively mock heroism yeah. and exalt the idea of looting, of, the, of you know, a woman just suddenly discovering there's a rebellion on great. I can smash a window and get a fur coat <laughs> coming on the stage. And so that there, were, there were many ways that the writers were at, ang at different angles to, let's say, the rebels or the memory of the rebels. While some of the rebels had been poets, there were, there were other people including indeed George Bernard Shaw, it's, it's very hard to look at St. Joan, for example, Shaw's play, without thinking of Patrick Pierce. In other words, that, that of those four writers who were uh, among the greatest writers in the English language of the time, each of the four of them um, had some relationship with the rebels and with the rebellion, but it wasn't about self, even though Yeats wrote A Terrible Beauty is Born, he also, in that very same poem, interrogates the rebellion and writes, you know, hearts with one purpose alone, through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. Uh, you know, he did interrogate um, the, the whole idea, was it excess of love bewildered them till they died? So that his, his poem is deeply ambiguous and questioning. So, so, so I think that relationship between writers and the state began in a sort of angular way and I think remains in that condition. Yeah. What do you... Sorry, you know, to follow on, on Colm, when I think of the foundation of the state, and of course, uh, the hugely uh, brave people in 1916, but I also think of something else, which is in 1902, I think. And, you know, if you had been able to be, to helicopter through Europe, you would have seen these incredible artistic initiatives in, in Germany and the sort of Franz Marc generation in Paris, of course, and the post-impressionists in, in London with Bloomsbury. But if you look down on Dublin, you would have seen two men in the Savoy Cafe in O'Connell Street. And one was James Joyce, and he was 20 years of age, and insufferable. And he was <laughs> sitting next to this man who was 32 years of age, or 33 years of age, who, of course, was William Yeats. And you so want to know what, what he said, but what James Joyce said was, he just leaned over and said, you are too old for me to help you. <laughs> and when I think of the state beginning, or when I think of where our hearts rise as Irish writers, you know, I have to think there as well, which is not at all to dishonor the, the, the people who went out of course and, and did it. But I love that our state has that bisection 
of these dissenting voices that in many ways really more enacted the dreams of those men who went out in 1916 than some of the legislation that followed. Yeah, wonderful. And we're lucky, actually, that we have great writers today still interrogating the state um, or the country. Um, Colin, would you like to read a little bit uh, now? We were, we were just thinking about commemoration, and this is a novel uh, that I wrote in 19, it was published in 1992, called The Heather Blazing. And in Enniscorthy, where I'm from, where, where the, the Consul General, Bar Barbara Jones, is from, the castle, Enniscorthy Castle, really was created in the, 80, in, sorry, in the 1590s and the, by the Wallop family. And there's a letter to the Queen from Sir Henry Wallop just saying the only thing we can do with these natives is obliterate them, is simply get rid of all of them. There isn't any future as long as these people are here. And the Queen, oddly enough, you know, she, she got a lot of letters like that from Ireland. And she paid, <laughs> she paid some attention sometimes, but not, she didn't, she, she, she didn't do it. But there's an, in, there's an interesting letter. Anyway, Walter Raleigh would have stayed in the castle. Edmund Spencer would have stayed in the castle. And um, so um, in the um, early 1960s, my father and a local priest actually bought the castle so that it could be used as a museum for the people of the town. And so the people of the town, suddenly this, this, this was the citadel. This was the place where power had been in the town, was suddenly now um, um, a museum. And, people, and they asked people, anyone who had anything old, to come. Um, and um, people came in and donated anything they had they thought was valuable. They didn't look for money. What they wanted was their names to be written in, in copper plate handwriting. And I, I, I want to we'll, we'll turn it, talk about handwriting in a moment. By a woman called Marion Stokes. She had put the flag up over the Athenaeum in the 1916 rebellion. The, this is her in the early 1960s. She has beautiful handwriting. She will write, this was donated to the castle by you know, John and Mary Foley on this date. And they were very proud of just having their names there. But um, th this is an account of um, um, my father and the priest, and I'm in the back of the car. I'm a little boy. I can't stop asking questions. To, we're going out the countryside because, of course, people have written in to say, we have something we think you might want, which are the tops of pikes from the 1798 rebellion. We have them. They, 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 they're in our house, and you can have them. Obviously, the wood would have rotted, but the metal was still there. And my father um, and the priest drove out with me in the back of the car. Um, I mean, I've changed the dates of this, I've changed the names of the priest, but this is more or less what happened. After the crossroads, there was a lane to the left, but they did not know if this was the correct turning. They tried the lane, which became increasingly rutted and overgrown, seeming to lead nowhere, and becoming even narrower as they came to a brightly painted gate. His father got out and opened it, held it as the car went through, then closed it and got back into the car. Suddenly the lane began to widen again. They reached a clearing and saw a small farmhouse with a galvanized roof. It's hard to imagine, Father Rossiter said, people living so far from the road. A sheepdog ran from the house and started to bark at the front wheels of the car. Two old people were now standing at the door. They were both watchful, almost furtive. The woman was wearing a cardigan and had her arms folded. Eamon, who's the boy, waited in the car with his father while Father Rossiter went to speak to the couple at the door. They were still unsure whether they were at the right house. Do they have old things? He asked his father. They have pikes from 98, his father said. That's what they said in the letter anyway. Did they find them? Stop asking questions now, he said. <laughs> father Rossiter returned to the car and motioned for them to come into the house. The dog had now stopped barking and wagged its tail as they passed. We thought there was something wrong when we saw the priest, the woman said, when they got inside the small kitchen, which had a huge blackened fireplace and a table up against the window. We have no tea. We can't get tea around here at the moment. Milk is the only thing I can offer you. We have plenty of that, thank God. Eamon sat down beside the table, running his finger along the plastic oil cloth with his pattern of flowers. The woman put a mug of milk in front of him. There were strange web-shaped cracks in the mug, which he inspected first before tasting the milk. <laughs> they came down by here. Now, the they here is the rebels of 1798. They came down by here, he heard the man saying to his father and Father Rossiter. No wonder 
They left whatever they were carrying. Sure weren't they bet? Didn't the English have muskets? The sheepdog came stealthily into the kitchen and lay in front of the fire with its eyes fixed on the man as he spoke and its head resting on its paws. Suddenly, the man shouted at it and the dog slithered off back to the yard. They were hard times, all right, the woman said. The man went into a room at the side and came back with a wooden pole with two curled metal hooks at the top of it. Father Rossiter and Eamon's father stood up and examined it eagerly. The hooks looked sharp and dangerous. The wood is new. I did it myself, the man said, but I didn't have to touch the metal. Do you have more of them? Father Rossiter asked. I have 20 or 30 of them here, the man said. Our grandmother now, on our mother's side, the woman said, she was brought up here. It was the time of the eviction. Sure, they used to own from here out to the road, the whole way, including the two big barley fields. She knew about the men of 98. The woman looked into the fire and then back at the two visitors. She would have been too young to remember it, but they told her about it, or she heard about it, and it was she who always said that they came down this way, and that was the end of them then. That's all I remember now. There was a man used to come here, and they used to talk about it. The room was filling up with smoke and from the fire. Eamon watched a small piece of soot falling slowly through the air and landing on the surface of his warm milk. It had a shape of its own, a curly black shape. He did not want to swallow it. He studied it for a while as the others talked and then put his finger into the milk and fished it out. He dried his finger on his trousers, having checked that no one was looking at him. Sure, they're no use to us at all, the man said. We'll be gone soon. Mm. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, when, I, when I was talking there about handwriting, um, that, that whole idea of, um, you know, um, among the committee... There was a woman, you know, and she was the one who had the handwriting. Mm. And um, that whole idea of the letters, the handwriting, yeah. Okay, yeah. just uh, reminded me of your poem. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you want to read it. But, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, th this poem, um, you know, it's just moving to hear that this woman had this beautiful handwriting. And this poem is called The Lost Art of Letter Writing. In many ways, it's about yeah. America. And that, that you know... I was often told by my mother, you would have known, when people left Ireland, the, no communications, the communication were letters. And they wrote home about their lives. And when we think of uh, imagining a country, I often think of those people in Boston or Philadelphia or New York, how intensely they must have imagined home. And, uh, you know, uh, wh when things were changing and going and they, their names were fading out of it, so this is called the, the Lost Art of Letter Writing. The ratio of daylight to handwriting was the same as lace making to eyesight, and the paper was so thin it skinned to air. The hand was fire and the page tinder. Everything burned away except the one place they singled out between their fingers held over a letter pad they set aside for the long evenings of their leave takings, always asking after what they kept losing, always performing, even when a shadow fell across the page and they knew the answer was not forthcoming, the same action. First the leaning down, the pen becoming a staff to walk the fields with as they vanished underfoot into memory. And then the letting up, the lighter stroke, which brought back crane's bill and thistle, a bicycle wheel rusting, an iron circle hurting the grass again, and the hedges veiled in hawthorn again, just in time for the main novenas recited in sweet air on a road leading to another road and then another one, widening to a motorway with four lines and ending in a new town on the edge of a city they will never see. And if we say an art is lost, when it no longer knows how to teach us sorrow to speak, come and see the way we lost it. Stacking letters in the attic, going downstairs, so as not to listen to the fields stirring at night, 
as they became memory and in the morning as they became ink. What we did so as not to hear them whispering the only question they knew by heart, the only one they learned from all those epistles of air and unreachable distance how to ask, is it still there? Um, so uh, just to return for a moment to the, the rising, um, one of the things that really struck me when I, like, like all of us, I've been indulging and in reading a lot about um, that time and was how uh, radical and progressive the men and women were. Not all of them, but many of them, very, uh, very progressive and ahead of their time. And women were invited into the fight, for example, and the, the proclamation of the Republic granted equal rights to all of Irish citizens, which was a big deal back then when women didn't have a vote and, and so on. But the Ireland that emerged after the dust had settled um, from our six years of, of war was anything but progressive. So where, where did it all go wrong? <laughs> well, I, I think that's a long, I mean, and I know Colin will speak about this very eloquently. I, I think it's a long, painful, you know, journey. And I think in some ways we need to look back with charity as well as criticism. They were other times and I, of course, regret parts of the Irish Constitution where women were concerned. I bitterly regret how, you know, the marriage bar, which, you know, fired women from their jobs when they got married, all these terrible things that didn't help a society understand where the gifts and strengths of itself lay. But I also think there was that forward movement in Ireland and we have come to a time uh, when, you know, I really rejoice not simply in seeing women uh, as just tremendous voices in the arts, but their voices in politics and their voices in, you know, the family and their, you turn on the television and they're speaking in, in these clear and powerful tones. It does happen, we do move forward. And I think, unfortunately, some of the reasons we move forward, are part of the past, and Colm, you would know that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the idea uh, of trying to examine those early years of the Irish state with some sort of charity, mm -hmm. let's say, but not with anachronism, I mean, not with the values of now, but I, mean, I, think, I think one of the big ones that, that, that we often, I think, misunderstand is the 1937 constitution under which we still live. Now, the 1937 Constitution has clauses about women, which really are, and they're still, some of them are still there, about the role of the woman in the house and uh, such things. But, but we have to remember, this is, uh, this is a constitution being written in Europe in 1937. There's not an inch of fascism in it. Mm -hmm. While other Catholic countries, Spain, Portugal, Italy, are finding it very easy to move in that direction. Ireland is partitioned, so the Southern Ireland is more or less a Catholic country, with the Catholic Church having enormous power, produces a constitution which actually gives rights. Those rights perhaps didn't become as, as um, significant um, in 1937 as they did later in the 1960s when Mary Robinson, as a lawyer, began to use them in, in the same way as Americans were using their constitution, that there were rights implied in the Irish constitution, not stated, but implied. And that gave us very many rights that were very important, including, for example, contraception, including the right for women to be on juries, came from that very constitution. So, so, so I think while, I mean, I, I, mean, I wouldn't want, I, I mean, I think the place to go, the marvelous thing about Ireland in all the years of the 20th century has been England. It's proximity if you're a writer, um, it's publishing industry, the way in which Irish people were in many ways welcomed into England or used England as a constant refuge. Um, I think that became an important element um, in our history, the strange undercurrent, while the governments could be at loggerheads 
oddly enough, the Irish in Liverpool, the Irish in Birmingham, yes. were, actually, were, were actually marrying I into England, having English children who were becoming English citizens, who were becoming important members of the, the trade union movement of the Labour Party in the same way as they did in America with the Democratic Party <laughs> on the East Coast. So that, um, th th as I think what this idea of complicating the narrative, that it, it requires as much revision and nuance as you can possibly give it, including in the, in including those dark years at the beginning of the Irish state when um, so many rights were taken away from people, especially women, to whom they had been promised um, uh, you know, in the, say, proclamation of 1916. I just wanted to, to ask if you feel that there are lessons in the Irish experience that would be useful to people who are interested in promoting uh, peace between Israel and Palestine today? And if so, what do you think they are? Well, you know, I, I'm going to answer that sideways and say that, you know, so when, when I was younger, I, I was often at tables in Dublin and um, people would come over, understandably, during the hard times of the 70s and they would say, the trouble about your country is. And I used to leave all those occasions and I used to say to my husband, I'm never going to comment on another country <laughs> as long as I live. <laughs> so I'm afraid I'm taking a dive on your question. Go yeah. ahead. There was, a, there, there was an Irish minister for foreign affairs and um, he asked his representative at the United Nations, there was a debate going on about the Middle East, if he could just issue a statement on behalf of Ireland that he would ask the people of the Middle East to settle their differences in a Christian fashion. <laughs> and um, when, he, when the diplomat pointed out, you know, this really, really wouldn't be suitable, he said, well, it might not be suitable at the United Nations, but in my constituency, it's exactly what people would like to hear. <laughs> um, but, but I think that we did have, and we were lucky we had in Ireland, at the figure of John Hume, who emerged as the leader of constitutional nationalism, who simply said a number of things, and he said them over and over. And sometimes he got, you know, people were tired listening to him eventually until he began to prevail. And they were that you make peace with your enemies, you don't make peace with your friends, yeah. and also there's no such thing as territory. There, are, there are really is only people. And he said that over, at every speech, every time he went anywhere, he would start by saying that people would yawn <laughs> until they began to listen and they began to think it was true. The, I mean, there, there, I, I think there's one issue, however, that's different, and we have to remember it, is that the land question had been settled in Ireland to a large extent by the time of the 1916 rebellion, courtesy of the British Parliament, of the British government. In other words, the big estates had been divided. N nobody was looking, and that went, was also the case with Northern Ireland in the recent troubles, nobody was looking for anyone else's land. People were looking for, 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 for a set of words a sort of constitution, issues to do with flags and symbols, where they would feel comfortable in their own country, even if it would involve hyphens between the names for their identities. But once you have a situation where people want one another's land, then there isn't a connection. Then, then you have to say, no, oddly enough, this is different. And th th there probably isn't anything to learn other than what John Hume said that again and again the mantra, and it's a, you know, the, somebody at some point will emerge who will just start saying, you make peace with your enemies, not your friends, and there is no such thing as territory, there are only people. Mm -hmm. And when someone starts to say that over and over, um, someone who's elected, John Hume was elected to three different parliaments, he had a huge mandate, and he mattered, and in the end he prevailed. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> So uh, I was reading the, uh, the document out front, and it, it, um, it sort of amounts to a, uh, a declaration of independence. And uh, it, uh, it reminds me of another uh, British possession uh, some period uh, earlier that had similarly declared independence. And I'm, uh, I'm wondering if, uh, to, to what degree uh, the, the signatories uh, were aware of the, uh, of the value of, of this American document uh, from 1776 and its, its uh, rhetorical resonance and, and was there any, uh, any reference to that or any, 
any thought that in the way that that shaped? Uh, you know, I, it's a very nice thought, but <laughs> I have some, you know, I think the proclamation of the Republic, of course, I mean, there has to be the, the echo, but, but I think what, what Cullum says, you know, that people like Tom Clark, who didn't care about poetry, cared about dynamite and had, you know, but, but when I think they should have known the Irish Constitution, just before the rising, Porrick Pierce went down to the burial of o O'Donovan Rossa, who was one of the last of the Fenians, a very big funeral in 1915. And he gave a remarkable speech at it and, and spoke about the people who had tried to take them. And then he said, you know, they've taken everything from us, our language and our land. He said, but the fools, the fools, the fools, they have left us our Fenian dead. And to me, it seems that that, almost that cloud of unknowing brought them to the proclamation. I, I would be very surprised. It, but of course, when they started going out to the States, but those signatories didn't go out to the States. It was de Valera went out and, and those people. But so I, I think the proclamation is written in an insular moment. But later, there will be, of course, these powerful connections. Um, I just want to say two things about that. Um, this rebellion I mentioned, 1798 in Wexford, you can find on the, uh, you know, on the native side, on the, uh, on the rebellion side, actual people who had been in America yeah. at the time of the revolution and had come home with this idea, you can get them out. But perhaps even more interestingly, some of the generals who began to encircle County Wexford in the summer of 1798 had, were men in their 40s and 50s, who when they were in their 20s, watched England losing America, were on the losing side. Yeah. Some of the very names, just go through the names, say, that couldn't, oh, it is the general, same General Lake. And then they went on to India to cause further trouble there. <laughs> and um, so, that, so, so, so that you get that there. But I think the second thing, which is really important, was who printed the American Declaration of Independence? An, an Ulster Presbyterian. Mm. And so that whole idea of the real importance of Ulster Presbyterians in pre-famine America, that the yeah. first emigration came from Ireland too. They came, uh, some of them were literate, some of them, some of them had capital, people like Henry James's grandfather, and they came with ideas of liberty to America from a Presbyterian origin in Ulster. And I, and I, and I think that when we're remembering Ireland and the connections between Ireland and America, the, the, and, and they gave, they, their descendants became some of the early presidents of America. But the printer, the man who printed, was, was a Presbyterian from Strabane. Yeah. And just that, that idea, again, of who gets left out of this narrative, yeah. of, of, of that emigration um, from, about, from about 1800 to 1840, which came mainly from Ulster, mainly Presbyterian, got lost in the aftermath when the word Irish-American took on a single meaning. Mm -hmm. And I think this had political ramifications later for Ireland itself. And, and it's something I think we should, we should I think, honor, commemorate, and remember. Yeah. Could you give us a sense, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, among the people um, in the Republic and the North about uh, reunification, the possibility of it? Well, you know, I, I, I think that in the very long and terrible years of, of conflict in the North of Ireland and sometimes spilling down to the South, you know, the there was a referendum that turned aside the claim on the land of the North. And I think that people came to an unspoken uh, consensus that, you know, if we wouldn't have uh, an agreed island, we'd have an agreed people. And I think it has, the peace process has inspired a, an enormous amount of people to understand that what looked like a compromise became a real liberation for people on, on both sides of the border. And I think many, many people would not wish that otherwise now. A tremendous cost was paid by the claims on territory, by the ideals of nationhood, and the thought of the people who lost their lives because of some of that language is still unbearably painful to many people. So I think that the peace process has brought us to a place. I mean, m my daughters live in an Ireland where they wouldn't think twice about 
being in Belfast and thinking that's Ireland and Belfast people coming here, there's, there's no longer any sense on the island that anyone is more Irish than anyone else. And I think that that idea that there could be costs so many people. So my sense is that, that it has become a very established part. That's, and people are very proud of the peace process in Ireland. And I think that what people want in the North now is, is a long period of stability, yeah. of building up institutions, local institutions, building up civic society. And there's also the question of the European Union. And so we, we, we're viewing with horror oh, the idea Brexit. of a British yeah. exit. Yeah. Um, because one of the things that happened in 1992 was the opening of the borders in Europe. That, that you could simply drive um, or go on the train from Belfast to Dublin. The train wouldn't stop at the border. There were no borders like that for customs anymore. Mm. That made a huge difference. The idea that now that border would be remade as a result of this referendum, I think horrifies us and I think horrifies people in Northern Ireland. I think if the vote by any chance is, is, is in favour, Scotland and Northern Ireland will be completely about, will, will vote overwhelmingly to stay in the European yes, Union yeah. because um, especially Northern Ireland have gained a great deal from the European Union and the idea of the two, of the two parts of the island being under that single umbrella has actually mattered and there is an idealism at the heart of the European Union about conflict resolution. And so that, that uh, if, if that were put in any danger now, I think horrify is the only word I can describe, it would horrify people. Yeah. Mr. Tobin, would you like to announce here in Philadelphia for the first time that your next work will incorporate the events of 1916 and we'll take those as a theme? <laughs> Um, I, I'm only interested um, in the past to the extent that I don't understand it, that, it, that what there's a dotted line to, the silences, the erasures, the things I can't find. I, I, I think I can find far too much almost in 1916. I, 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 I can actually, you see, because the archival, just, just very briefly, in the 1940s, Eamon de Valera, who was afraid that all this memory would be lost, asked anyone involved to write down what they remembered. There's a huge archive now of that. There's a huge archive of anyone who applied for pensions arising from what they did. So the historians really have a field day with this extraordinary amount of information. There's nothing I can do to add to that. My, in ways that I will imagine, I want to imagine what is not known, what's half known, what's been whispered, and what's not been said. The ambiguity, the, the thing that was in the shadow, and the rebellion for me is not in that place. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, I can't announce this. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in terms of frame of reference, I'm a Belfast Catholic who grew up with a copy of this proclamation hanging in the living room. Um, but um, what, I, what I wanted to ask was, um, I, I love the fact that you shed some light on, on the very repressive constitution. And I wondered if you would talk for a minute or two about how, how um, you know, coming out of the civil rights movement and the, and the troubles, um, how that constitution really put the North and South very much at odds with each other, not just Catholics and Protestants, but, but the North and the South very much at odds with each other. The constitution, I think, had a great number of, of problems. Some of the problems were territorial claims. Some of them were about women. Some of them undoubtedly go back. I mean, I was in the early women's movement in Ireland when there were a, a number of tremendous legislative flaws in the, uh, that covered the lives of women. And they really horrified me. I was 21 and 22. I remember going home one day and saying to a, an uncle who was there, you know, why can women not sit on a jury? And uh, um, he said, well, why would women want to sit on a jury? <laughs> and uh, my mother said to me, you know, don't be worried. She said, well, when I was young, someone once said to me, women are too beautiful to vote. So, you know. <laughs> So, you know, there was this conversation that 
I look back on now, as I said, with considerably more charity than I did at the time. And, you know, I, I want to pay tribute to the name here that raised by column of Mary Robinson, who was simply indefatigable about taking to the European court these flaws, these understandings. I'm, I know that the Constitution, in terms of our own strong connections with the north of Ireland and its immensely rich history, was really tragic, but I, I did think that it was a great moment when those claims were dropped and when we could become part of one conversation. Um, you know, the proclamation is, is a very eloquent document, but it's also a document with claims. So I, I think we just have to make sure that the conversation we have in Ireland about who we are and what we become is as inclusive as we can make it. The framers of the Constitution thought they were doing the right thing. I'm afraid the, the, the framers of the Censorship of Publications Act thought the same. But they weren't doing the right thing. They were taking away these beautiful books by these wonderful writers from young men and women in Ireland who could go forward with them in their hearts. A lot of those people in the Constitution and the Censorship Act thought they were keeping the moral nature of Ireland safe. I think they weren't, but I never doubted their good faith. I just wish they hadn't had it. <laughs> anyway. Um, just that, um, I, th I think, as usual, it's, it's worth looking at what the writers are up to in this situation. That, um, that in the 1970s, Sir Tyrone Guthrie, the great theatre director, left his home which could have easily been in Northern Ireland, it's right on the border. He left his house to, to the nation to be used as a residence for artists. It was the first time anything was funded jointly by the North and the South. So the Northern Irish Arts Council would have to meet with the Southern Irish Arts Council about funding this institution. Southern Irish writers and painters and composers were meeting their counterparts from the North in this house in, under very easy circumstances. I mean, sometimes going right through the night and the arguments were not about politics or about <laughs> art. We just talked to each other. And, you know, that, uh, and Ivan, you know, will, will I think remember this, that um, when that flowering of um, poetry came from Northern Ireland um, in, in the 1960s, it had so much to do with the South. Those writers were either Seamus Heaney living in the South or Derek Mahan living in the South or Michael Longley having attended Trinity, that you knew those people, that there was a constant crossing of the border, um, as there still is, that we, we, we would see, uh, as a novelist, I would see Glenn Patterson or Robert McLean Wilson as my colleagues, we're, 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 we're all Irish. We just happen to be from different parts of the country. So that in a way, politics is often for slow learners. <laughs> you know, what yes. we have been imagining <laughs> in, in our own way. I'm going to steal that quote. <laughs> um, so I think we've time for one more question. And Ivan, would you like to close with a poem? Do you have a poem in you? Yes. <laughs> OK. Um, but we'll take one more question. Thank you. So my question is to each of you, what one book would you recommend to a person like myself who has liked to learn about the history of Ireland and how it came about, the uprising and going all the way to today? Is there any one book that you would recommend? Well, you know, it, it, actually, there's a recent book, you know, by Roy Foster called Vivid Faces. And I think it's a lovely, eloquent book because it's got the whole span of families and cousins and quarrels. And uh, it, it shows that it was a deeply human moment. And we, we might forget that. And it's really, really a, an excellent book to read. Yeah, that book, Vivid Faces, is, is the history of a generation. It's, it's showing it's they wonderful. didn't just want to take arms against England. 
they wanted to wear different sorts of clothes or have different <laughs> sort of family lives or fall in love differently. Yeah. And, and he's interesting about who was gay, for example, or who just had different sorts of dinner parties and sisters coming to Dublin and each of them marrying a revolutionary and yeah. how, the yeah. love, how they wrote De Valera's love letters. <laughs> you know, and that, that, that each of them was involved in, the, in making their own little revolution domestically as well as their military revolution. And he catches this by reading their letters and their diaries. He catches an idea of what Ireland was like, say, in 1910, yeah. to see then each, each of the, what love letters they were writing, bef you know, six years before they were writing a proclamation. And I think that book really gives you a sense. It's called Vivid Faces by yeah. Roy Foster. It's published by Norton. And, and I think book. that book would, would, I think really, um, it, it's an intriguing new way of looking at this particular story. Well, thank you so much, both of you and Yvonne, whenever you're ready. <laughs> yes, indeed. You know, well, I'm very honored to read this poem in this company. You know, um, the, sorry, the, the reference here at the beginning, it's just a very short poem called The Emigrant Irish. And, you know, in, a, in an awe-inspiring history that is another history, you know, electrification came west of the Shannon, uh, and people had light switches and all that kind of thing. And my husband's really wonderful mother came from Mayo. And she said to me, well, you know about electrification. They took all those beautiful oil lamps and they threw them out. <laughs> and so it was a, a different narrative of electrification. And, you know, when I wrote this poem long ago, I had this great sense of how awful it would be to forget those people who left our shores, came to this great country, and were our strength and our memory. And the thought of them being there is always moving to me, the emigrant Irish. Like oil lamps, we put them at the back of our houses, of our minds. We had lights better than, newer than, and then a time came, this time, and now we need them. Their dread makeshift example they would have thrived on our necessities. What they survived, we could not even live. By their lights now, it is time to imagine how they stood there, what they stood with, that their possessions may become our power. Cardboard, iron, their hardships parceled in them, patience, fortitude, long suffering in the bruise-colored dusk of the new world, and all the old songs and nothing to lose. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You've been a great audience, and thank you, Ivan and Callum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.